Hi everyone, I hope you enjoy this recital that I recently recorded live here in my apartment in Philadelphia. Don't forget to check my website for upcoming live streams as well as a soon to be uploaded sneak preview of the music I'm preparing for a collaboration with the Czech Center in New York to celebrate the 80th anniversary of when Bohuslav Martinu left Paris and settled in New York and began to invest in the cultural life there. I hope you enjoy the music. Thank you for joining me this evening in Philadelphia from my um, home studio, my living room, my workplace here in the last 10 months of quarantine. That was uh, Samuel Barber's Nocturne, Opus 33, that he completed in 1958. I chose this piece to begin our evening together because I thought it evoked this beautiful mood of what I've been thinking about and what I kind of wanted to explore with the pieces that I chose this evening 
the concept of nocturne, improvisation, extemporaneous thinking, this sort of fantasy world, if you will, where the creative mind of the composer is unmoored from the compositional conventions, the structural conventions, etc. And I chose a group of pieces from different cultures, different time periods, to see if we could explore the feedback or the vocabulary used. So obviously we started with a mid 20th century American composer and later in the evening we will hear a composition from the same year, 1958, but written by a composer not from the US, but a composer that was writing behind the Iron Curtain in a time of really severe artistic and cultural repression. We will go back in time and see what Bach had to say in the Baroque about creativity and improvisation with the Fantasia. We will also look at some Chopin, of course. We can't talk about nocturnes without talking about Chopin. And then we will also go to classical and early romantic Viennese style with Mozart and a composer named Jan Václav Vortyshek. So first, I wanted to give you a few words by Liszt, because while I'm not playing any piano music by Franz Liszt this evening, there is no way that we can't, that we could talk about fantasy and creativity and spontaneous virtuosity without pulling in the idea and the creative genius of Franz Liszt. And as it happens, I can quote for you his words in conjunction with how he experienced the genre of the nocturne. A uh, few weeks ago, when I was speaking with a piano student of mine who is a composer, we were exploring nocturnes together and I suggested for her to look at the very first pieces that were published in the name nocturne. It was not by Chopin, but by an Irish composer a few decades before Ch Chopin named John Fields. And in the introduction to this work uh, that was edited by Liszt, uh, Franz Liszt tried to put into his own words what his experiences were of the pieces. And I thought, well, when I read these in conjunction with this discussion with my student, it sparked the germ of the idea of comprising these pieces, which we are now hearing together. And it also gave me this very interesting perspective or moment of imagination of what it was like for mid 19th century composers, musicians, or audiences to experience this genre for the first time. So let me read a few comments that Liszt had to make. He, this is many page longs, anyone who has read uh, Liszt's works knows that he tends on the verbose side of the spectrum. But he begins to talk about what music was previously being written, and then he wrote, It was formally necessary that they should either be sonatas or rondos, etc. He's talking about previous music. Field, however, was the first to introduce a species which belonged to none of the established classes, and in which feeling and melody reigned alone, liberated from the fetters and encumbrances of a coercive form. Now, we know, in, even in the music that I'll play today, that of course, composers of before field were writing in this type of improvisatory and free style. But I think what Liszt is responding to is this new feeling of the character piece that was being developed in this early Romantic period, in which the hallmark of the classical period, the structure of the sonata and all of its rigidity and expectations was being slowly disintegrated and pushed to the side, if you will. What I found the most interesting that sparked my imagination was a later sentence in which Liszt attempted to evoke in words the feeling that he had upon the first time of hearing one of these nocturnes by John Field. He wrote, I experience hallucinations without fever or rather floating evanescent images whose ravishing beauty in a moment of delightful illusion heightens emotion into passages. I think this image of the hallucination without fever, so the hallucination without just the, um, the terrifying aspects that come with it, 
is a very beautiful imagery and I would like you to keep that in your mind as we go through these different pieces of the evening. So the next piece I would like to play is another nocturne, this time by Chopin, not the inventor or the originator of the genre, but I could probably say without too much pushback from my colleagues and fellow pianists that he definitely perfected and made the genre nocturne synonymous with his name. I will play for you Opus 9, number 2, E flat. pieces that I would like to play for you are two Fantasias. The first Fantasia will be by Bach and it was written almost exactly 100 years before this Chopin Nocturne. And it is true that many people when they are listening to Baroque pieces that are based either on improvisation or not on improvisation will hear it in a more structured way than this type of freedom that's clearly felt with the appoggiaturas and the broken bass lines and the furatura and the rubato of the style of Chopin. 
it is not true that the feelings of rubato and extemporaneous expression are not there. We just have to tune our ears slightly differently. In Bach being a habit or a product of the Baroque time period, the basic unit of time for the musical gestures are much smaller, sometimes being only a single measure of the music, instead of the more singing style of the classical time period, and especially in the romantic time period, when we're hearing four or eight bars together as a musical phrase and allowing the rhythm to push and pull between these larger sort of posts of the music. In this Bach, it's definitely feeling one measure at a time, and there's much more of a dialogue and independence between the right hand and the left hand. But that doesn't mean that there isn't freedom of expression within the highly nuanced and highly ornamental fabric of the trills and mordants and arpeggios that you hear. The second piece is another Fantasia by Mozart, and I'll play the two of them together without speaking because the Mozart really needs no introduction. To my mind, the Mozart, I put it as sort of the center of our musical evening together because it begins with this very luxurious strumming in the bass, evoking this mood of D minor ending on a dominant cadence. We have this expectation, a breath, a pause. He writes in a measure of rest. Nobody knows what's going to happen. And then from the middle of that, we hear the loneliness to the most painful, simple melody that I think exists in music. Should say one of, because there's many pieces that have this evocation, but the Mozart is very special. And it's a piece that in the last 10 months of um, quarantine and teaching online and missing people, I have come again and again and again to this melody and it evokes the feeling that I am afraid that many of us feel still in the present day. So with those many ideas and feelings in mind, enjoy Bach Fantasia, Mozart Fantasia written in both in the 18th century about 45 years apart from each other.
fact about this Mozart Fantasia is he left it unfinished. There was about, um, right before the very last one of these, the last 10 bars, he left it finished and he never came back to it. The version that I played was completed by a student of his who had written that he had heard Mozart play it this time, or this way. I've heard other people improvise and maybe go back this way to finish with something at the end, which is another lovely way, and I've practiced improvising three or four different endings depending on the mood and depending on where it sits in the piece. So it's a fun example of where we can combine hallmarks of classicism at its highest peak, also with improvisation, real improvisation. Sometimes I begin the fantasy and I have it picked in my mind which ending I want, but I sort of wait to see how the timing, how it feels in the space, how the energy of the audience feels, etc. So that's a fun little fact for you if you ever play this piece or if you do play it and want to find some other ways to enliven the end or your imagination as you are playing. So, unfortunately, we have to take the joy of that ending, a D major section, and move into a little bit darker part of human and cultural political history. As promised, I said I would take you behind the Iron Curtain. And it's interesting because the piece that we're going to talk about, a set of impromptus written in 1958 by a composer named Miloslav Istvan, who was active in Brno, which is the capital of Moravia in the Czech Republic. And it's very funny because geographically, these two pieces are very close together. So Vienna and Brno are now, uh, by modern train, about an hour and a half from each other. Though culturally and time period and aesthetic, they couldn't be more different. But the element of improvisation and really true, deeply felt humanity is clear from both of them. These impromptus, written in 1938, as I said, are relatively young compositions for Istvan. It was only his second piece that he had written for solo piano, and in many ways I hear them each being a exploration or a way of searching out different keyboard figurations. Each one of them are very short, very crystalline, usually about a minute and a half in length, and focused on one pivotal musical idea. Perhaps it's trills, perhaps it's arpeggios, perhaps it's repeated notes, perhaps it's an emotion or a psychological feeling. The first one is very effervescent and very clear from the beginning that the whole thing is gonna be lifting us up and up and up until we reach the climax and then everything filters down again in the center of the piece before we return to the A section with this upward rising gesture. The second one is the most painful, literally, for the ears because it, there is these half step, high jabbing uh, gestures in the center of the piece. And he titles it Blessed Me as the character or tempo marking, which is literally painfully. So that's very accurate. But he doesn't leave us in the pain. The ending of the piece is very low in the register and very sad. It's in A flat minor. But the second piece, the piece that comes after that, the opening is in the same register, same notes, except for instead of the minor third, we have the major third. And it brings us back up again. So there's a little bit of hope even in despair. And the final one is perhaps my favorite because of this hypnotic trance that he puts myself as the performer and possibly you in the audience with the centrality of a constant repeated eighth note in the bass. And above that there is a beautiful strumming melody, very folk-like melody, but surrounding that, pushing us inexorably to the conclusion is this repeated eighth note. So, the impromptus of Miloslav Istvan from 
I saved for the very last, the most substantial piece of the evening. It's about 12 minutes long. And in my hearing, it combines many of the elements that we have heard so far. So there's a little, there's a few little fugato, contrapuntal moments, dialogue between the hands, similar to the Bach. We have a lot of the broken chord and the arpeggios that we heard in the Chopin. There's a little bit of a scherzo-like uh, feel at the end, a little bit of humor. And then the opening is very, very improvised with a few lovely singing melodies similar to the Mozart, but much higher in the register and much more virtuosic with its own fioritura and ornamental, upon ornamental passages, similar to what we heard in the Barber or the passages in the Chopin. The piece was written in the early 1800s in Vienna so about 30 years after Mozart had written his Fantasia in Vienna. And this is also called a Fantasia, Opus 12, by a Czech composer who was born in Prague named Jan Václav Voršíšek. He had studied with Tomášek in Prague, who is credited with sort of formulating this early romantic character piece, which was very interesting and semi-ironic, at least to me, because he, in his soul, really wanted to follow the legacy of the singing style of Mozart. But unbeknownst to him, he developed a genre that would usher in sort of the romantic era of the character piece and the symphonic tone poems, etc. So it's very interesting. Vorshishek studied with Tomaszek in Prague and then he wanted to study again with Mozart. So he moved to Vienna. Instead of being taken with Mozart as he expected to be, instead he fell under the spell of Beethoven. And there's many of the stormy C minor elements that we're accustomed to hearing in Beethoven, but with his own personal twist. I believe that's all that needs to be said. This is the Fantasia C major, C minor, by uh, Jan Václav Vorzyszek. And it's quite a journey. The beginning, the first chord, ambiguous, not sure yet, C major, C minor, but immediately C major. However, this exact same chord spacing register on the keyboard is how we end the piece, but not in C major anymore, in C minor. So enjoy the 12 minutes of how Gorzyszek takes you from C major to C minor.